since the formation of the United States, its mainland has never been invaded or had any major attack. But there are places there which have had more nuclear explosions than anywhere else on Earth. Of the 1,054 US nuclear tests, 928 were carried out on the US mainland, mostly at the Nevada test site. But it wasn't just the US testing nukes. The Soviets, British, French, Chinese, Indian and Pakistanis, and more recently the North Koreans have all tested nuclear weapons, some on their own territory and some in remote locations around the world, in the air, on the land, underwater and even in space. But by far, it's the US and the Soviets that were the biggest players. But what happened at and to the nuclear test sites? The very first full-scale nuclear test was the Trinity explosion of May 16, 1945 at the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. This was to prove the theories developed by the Manhattan Project would actually work in reality. Trinity was an implosion device that used plutonium. This was in response to the original design, which was a gun-type device that used uranium-235. But at the time, uranium-235 had to be refined almost an atom at a time. And even using the massive X-10 graphite reactor at the newly constructed Oak Ridge National Laboratory, it would take years to get enough uranium-235 for just one bomb. Plutonium could be made much easier in a reactor, but in order to make it become critical and an explosive device, a ball of it would have to be compressed to about half its size with an explosive lens. And this is what the Trinity test was all about. As the bomb exploded, the 30 meter metal tower, its support structure and the bomb casing itself was vaporized along with the sand of the desert floor below. As the vaporized material cooled and fell back to the ground, it became a green glassy mineral, now called trinitite. In some of the greenish glass, there are patches of red, which is thought to be the copper wire, which was used to trigger the explosive lens. Just after the war, samples of trinitite were sold as jewelry because it was thought that the fireball had just melted the sand and that it wasn't particularly radioactive although now it's illegal to take samples from the site which is open to the public twice a year. The level of radiation at the Trinity Ground Zero site is now approximately for one hour of exposure, about the same as the average US citizen would get per day from natural radiation sources. Following the war, nuclear testing moved to the Nevada Proving Grounds, about 100 kilometers northwest of Las Vegas. From 1951 until 1962, 100 above-ground tests were performed, becoming a bit of a tourist attraction in Las Vegas, where they could feel the seismic shockwave through the ground and see the mushroom cloud rising in the distance. At the time, even though the effects of radiation were becoming much more well-known, little was done to reduce the fallout. But it wasn't just bombs which they tested. The government wanted to know how buildings, infrastructure and people might fare if there was a nuclear attack. So they built typical American houses, fully furnished. Industrial buildings, parts of bridges, electrical supply stations, even bank vaults in the test zone and exploded nuclear devices nearby. They tested different types of concrete and building materials to see which would be more resilient. In fact, many of the building codes now in use today are based on the results of these nuclear tests. As part of the government's attempts to reassure the public that things like their money and valuable documents and records would be safe in the event of a nuclear attack, Edwin Mosler, the president of the Mosler Safe Company, whose biggest customer was the government, built an armored vault on the Frenchman Flats test area near a 37 kiloton test to prove that it would withstand the heat and blast, which it did and it's still there today, minus the door, which was removed afterwards. Air bursts are considered cleaner than ones just above the ground, because if the fireball reaches the ground, soil and other materials are sucked up into the fireball and mixed with the nuclear elements to make a highly radioactive cloud that can travel for hundreds of kilometers. In 1953, a 32 kiloton device nicknamed Harry 
was detonated. The device later became known as Dirty Harry because this test generated more fallout than any other US continental test. Due to an error and an unexpected change in the wind direction, the fallout was blown over 200 kilometers and over the city of St. George, Utah, where the people said there was an oddly metallic sort of taste in the air. But the prevailing winds carried the fallout from many of the Nevada tests over southern Utah, but the effects were spread across much of the mid-US, affecting over 3,000 counties and causing a marked increase in the number of cancers from the mid-1950s up until the early 1980s. As of 2014, the US government had approved 28,880 claims for a total of $1.9 billion in compensation to servicemen at the test ranges and to the public who had been exposed to radioactive fallout. Because of the Partial Test Ban Treaty of 1963, atmospheric tests were banned and all testing went underground. The thinking was that if the test could be contained deep underground, there would be little or no fallout, but they could still contaminate underground water sources if poorly located. In this shot of the area from Google Earth, each one of the small circular marks is a subsidence crater formed as a result of an underground test. Some 828 were done this way. The biggest of these, which can be seen unaided from space, was part of Operation Plowshare to see if nuclear devices could be used in the peaceful use of excavating large areas of land quickly. The Sedan Crater, which is 100 meters deep and 390 meters across, was formed by a 104 kiloton device detonated 194 meters underground in July 1962. The test displaced 11 million tons of soil, but the fallout which spread northeastwards in two separate clouds as far as Iowa was found to be too highly radioactive to make this a practical, peaceful use of nuclear explosions in the US at least, but it has believed to have been used in the Soviet Union. Today, the crater can be visited and the levels of radiation are safe enough as not to warrant any protective clothing. However, in the Soviet Union at this time, there was less of a concern for the health and safety of the rural population of Kazakhstan near the Semipalatinsk test site, which was also known as the Polygon. The test site was created as a top priority on the orders of Stalin by the Marshal of the Soviet Union and head of the NKVD secret police, Lavrenti Beria, in 1947. The facilities were built on an 18,000 square kilometer area of a steppe in northeastern Kazakhstan with gulag forced labor in what Beria said was uninhabited land, but actually had around about a million people living within a 160 kilometer radius of a site and had many villages much closer. Between 1949 and 1989, 456 tests were performed. Of that, 116 were above ground either airdropped or on towers, the last of which occurred in 1962. The total yield of the tests over the site's 40-year history is equivalent to about 400 Hiroshima-sized bombs or about 6 megatons. After the collapse of the Soviet Union and Kazakhstan became a separate country, the area was neglected and nuclear materials were left unguarded in mountain tunnels and boreholes, many of which were targeted by scavengers looking for scrap metal, but not necessarily knowing what they were picking up. The significant amounts of plutonium left behind were considered to be one of the biggest nuclear security threats, and in 2012, Russian, US and Kazakh scientists completed a secret 17-year, $150 million cleanup operation to make the site safe, which included things like filling boreholes and tunnels with special concrete but chemically bonded with plutonium. It's only in the last few years that the scale of the radiation damage has come to light. The Soviet state covered up the extent of the damage for decades, and it wasn't until 1956 that any studies were conducted into the effects on the local population. The Institute of Radiation Medicine and Ecology in Simi, or what was known as Semipalatinsk, has said that between 500,000 and 1 million people were exposed to substantial radiation doses when the atmospheric tests were being carried out, which led to a dramatic increase in cancer, 
birth defects and mortality from the effects of radiation. You can find out more in the report by the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs at the address shown now and also in the description. But for the biggest Soviet tests, they needed somewhere even more remote. Navoya Zimla is a crescent-shaped island group in the Arctic Ocean off of the northern coast of Russia. There are three test zones on the islands, zones A, B and C. It's most famous for being the place where the largest ever nuclear test took place on October the 31st, 1961, when the Tsar Bomber, a 50 megaton nuclear device, was dropped over test zone C. Originally designed to have a yield of 100 megatons, it was scaled back because of fears of the large amount of fallout it would create and that the plane carrying the bomb would not be able to escape the fireball in time. Even with a 50 megaton blast, the specially modified TU-95V was only given a 50% chance of survival. The Tsar bomber was detonated at 14,000 feet, 4,260 meters, creating a fireball eight kilometers across, but it was stopped from reaching the ground by its own huge shockwave reflected back from the ground. The release plane managed to get 45 kilometers away before the detonation, but it still dropped a kilometer in the air due to the shockwave. However, it made it back to base safely and the pilot flying the plane resigned from the Air Force shortly after the test. The explosion was so large that the fireball was visible over a thousand kilometers away. Every building within a 55 kilometer radius was destroyed. Wooden houses in districts hundreds of kilometers away were destroyed and stone ones had their roofs blown off and windows and doors blown in. The mushroom cloud reached an altitude of 65 kilometers or 213,000 feet, seven times the height of Everest and the heat from the fireball could create third degree burns a hundred kilometers away. This wasn't the only test carried out at Novoya Zimla. There were 224 nuclear detonations with a total yield of 265 megatons. That's 132 times more than the total amount of munitions used by all sides during World War II, including the two atomic bombs on Japan. The last nuclear test was carried out there in 1990, and today it's still a military test area, although mostly a barren Arctic island. Visitors there have found only slightly raised levels of radiation, but access to the main test sites is not possible. For the larger US tests, they also used remote islands and atolls, but this time in the South Pacific. Testing started there in 1948, after the islands came under control of the US as part of the Trust Territory of the Pacific Islands. And by 1962, 105 atmospheric and underwater tests had been carried out. The first ever test after Trinity and the Japanese atomic bombs was to find out if Navy ships could withstand a nuclear attack. Operation Crossroads was performed in the lagoon at Bikini Atoll because of its remote location, suitable weather, and only a small population of 167 people which were relocated. The Galapagos Islands had also been considered as a possible nuclear test site. The test was witnessed by invited members of the press and the public. Over 90 ships, including captured German, Japanese, and surplus US ships, would make up the test fleet in the lagoon. This was to be a three bomb test. The first, being called Abel, was an airdrop exploding 158 meters above the fleet, with the following tests being underwater. All three bombs were to be the same as the 23 kiloton Fat Man implosion bomb dropped on Nagasaki. The Abel test was hampered by the bomb being 650 meters off target. Five ships were sunk and 14 seriously damaged. The second test called Baker was an underwater test, the first time that this had occurred. It created a host of effects, many of which had never been seen before. But the biggest was the fact that it made the sea in the lagoon highly radioactive. The radiation was so bad that many of the ships could not be decontaminated but some in the Navy didn't believe the problem was real. It was only when a Navy surgeon retrieved a fish from the lagoon and placed it next to a piece of photographic film which it exposed 
that they decided to cancel the third test. Only five ships were able to be used after the test and the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, Glenn T. Seaborg, called it the world's first nuclear disaster. In 1952, the first hydrogen bomb test, codenamed Ivy Mike, took place at the bigger Eni Wetok Atoll, 320 kilometers east of Bikini. This wasn't so much a bomb as a scientific experiment, as the hydrogen fuel had to be cooled with a massive cryogenic plant. When it was detonated, it produced a yield of 10.4 megatons. But over 8 megatons of that came from the fast fission of the uranium tamper, which created a huge amount of fallout and an underwater crater 1.9 kilometers wide and 50 meters deep. By 1954, the hydrogen bomb had been refined to become a device that could be dropped from a plane. And on the 28th of February, the first of six bomb tests were carried out as part of Operation Castle at Bikini Atoll. The Castle Bravo test was estimated to have a yield of six megatons, but due to an unexpectedly high performance of the lithium-7 in the design, it actually had a yield of 15 megatons, and to this day is the largest US nuclear explosion. Because of the much greater power, the fallout was much more than expected, with highly radioactive calcium from the vaporized coral reef below the bomb, not only covering the Bikini Atoll itself, but also blowing eastwards and contaminating other atolls, where both US personnel and islanders were residing at the time. A Japanese fishing boat was also caught in the fallout, and one member of the crew died of radiation sickness a few days afterwards. To this day, Bikini Atoll is still heavily contaminated and crops grown there are not safe to eat. At Eni Wetok, a crater on the small island of Runit, which had been formed by a bomb test, was used by the US to dump contaminated topsoil and radioactive debris, including plutonium, from a bomb that failed to explode correctly. Starting in 1977, 4,000 US servicemen worked for three years to clean up the area and then cover the waste with a concrete dome. However, this was only meant to be a temporary measure until something more permanent could be arranged, and only four out of the 40 islands contaminated were cleaned. Because of this, the bottom of the test crater was not lined with concrete, and so now, with rising sea levels caused by climate change, seawater is seeping inside through the porous bedrock into the dome and leaching out radioactive material. But the seabed of the Eniwetok Lagoon is actually as radioactive as the material under the dome. It's been estimated that it will cost nearly a billion dollars to clean up the area effectively, and instead it's proposed that contaminated areas be treated with potassium, which would only cost around about a hundred million. Many of the US servicemen that built the dome and worked on the cleanup claim they were not told they would be cleaning up radioactive waste and were not given proper training or protective clothing. In the decades since the end of the cleanup, many have died of cancer and had other health problems which they say is related to their exposure to the radiation. However, because they were not at the test sites when the tests were being performed, the US government says they are not eligible for compensation. The full effects of nuclear testing are difficult to quantify, but there has been a growing body of evidence over the last 60 years or so. Whichever way you look at it, every nuclear power put the development of increasingly more devastating weapons ahead of the health and safety of not only their own people, but also many others for generations to come who were far removed from the political decision makers. And that is the legacy of the nuclear test sites. In 1991, a study by the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, the IPPNW, estimated that by the year 2000, 430,000 cancer deaths would have been related to atmospheric testing, and concluded that eventually about 2.4 million deaths would be the result of the nuclear tests. So what are your thoughts on the issues of nuclear tests and the effects they've had and are still having? Let me know in the comments below. And also don't forget to subscribe, thumbs up and share the video please. Although the tests were the practical demonstration of the theories, 
The ideas themselves came from the brightest minds in maths and physics, using nothing more than slide rules and blackboards, but even the best had to start somewhere. If you want to develop your intuition in maths and science, then you need to check this out. This is from Brilliant, an interactive problem-solving website where you can solve real-world problems and learn to think like a scientist. By breaking down a problem into easy to understand steps and then pulling it back together so you can see how the overall process works. Brilliant helps you develop your intuition about these concepts. Having these math and skill sets in your mental toolbox is valuable because it gives you a much deeper understanding of how the world works. Whether you're a professional, hobbyist or scientist, you can get started for free at Brilliant dot org forward slash curious droid and if you're one of the first 287 people to upgrade to the premium subscription you'll get 20% off <laughs>